Right, thank you very much. That's a great turnout tonight. Um, my name's Matt. We're going to be talking about behavior-driven development and some BHAT stuff at the end. There will be a live demo. It may fail. It's the nature of the game. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at a company called Viva IT. Uh, if you've ever seen a bunch of people walking around in orange hoodies at <laughs> conferences, South Coast, Northwest, Symphony Live, that kind of thing, we're generally the guys walking around in uh, orange hoodies. If you want to talk about anything on Twitter with me, at Bronte, fire questions about BDD uh, at me all day. I'm not, uh, not fussed about that. Uh, you can also find me at PHP Midlands. I'm the organizer for uh, the PHP Midlands user group based in Leicester. So if you do ever find yourself in the Midlands for whatever reason, traveling for work or whatever, we meet on the first Thursday of the month, uh, very similar to this um, with talks. So before we talk about behavior-driven development, and I will use BDD and behavior-driven development interoperable, whatever, I will stumble over, stumble over my words with this because there's BDD and TDD and DDD and all those things, and it's... It's a nightmare. So let's get a little bit of background on what I'm talking about. Who here practices test-driven development? Who here writes the tests before they write the code? Who here hates calling them tests? OK. TDD and BDD, people often sort of disagree sometimes about what they are. Um, they're pretty much one and the same, actually. Um, BDD focuses on a larger audience rather than just the developer. Um, it sort of focuses on the things that you're using aren't just understood and worked with by developers. It's worked on with people outside of the sort of development sphere as well. Um, because of that, BDD emerged from test-driven development and it focuses on the higher level business value in what it is we're trying to do with software. There's a quote that comes out uh, every so often and it says that BDD is TDD done right. And people get very angry if you say this, and they think that you're discounting them if they're doing test-driven development. That's not what this, this is saying. What this is saying is that if you're doing test-driven development correctly, essentially, you are actually performing behavior-driven development. You just probably don't realize it. Um, and this is because sort of TDD focuses on developers. And the developers think too much about how they're building something. They think about the design patterns and building it properly with best practices and is this bit of code you know, conforming to solid and that side of things. But then what happens with the what? What is it you're actually trying to build? Why are you trying to build it? And that's the sort of the business value that behavior-driven development focuses on. So to sort of sum that up in a few sort of little sentences, test-driven development is building the thing right. The thing you're building, you're building it properly with best practices in code. Behavior-driven development makes sure that you're building the right thing. Because you can build a bit of code that works perfectly and does all these things. Doesn't mean it's doing what someone actually wanted it to do. So if anything, sort of test-driven development is the how, and behavior-driven development is the why. So behavior-driven development specifies that any test or sort of unit or uh, section of your code or your software, um, it's described in terms of the behavior of how it should work. Um, it sort of borrows from Agile in a lot of ways, and um, behavior consists of user requirements, uh, user stories, the ex more of the acceptance testing level for the type of BDD that I will be focusing on today. Um, so with BDD in practice, it means that it's more of an outside in activity in the sense that you don't care about what's going on under the surface. That's more of the test driven development side of it. You're sitting on the outside of the software, focusing on how the software behaves to you um, outside of the code. There's two main types of behavior-driven development. One is spec BDD. Um, so tools like PHP spec, who's heard of or used PHP spec at all? Um, that's more of your lower level, almost like a unit test type library, um, more for design than testing, but that's where that sits. We'll be looking at BHAT later on, which is more on the acceptance testing level, also known as sort of scenario BDD, because we'll be using user stories as our requirements um, and looking at scenarios and how they fit in with this. So, there'll be homework at the end of this and there'll be a pop quiz. You get 10 seconds to memorize this quote. BDD is a second generation, outside in, pool based, multiple stakeholder, multiple scale, high automation, agile methodology. Three, two, one. I'm not gonna make you remember it, don't worry. Um, we'll break it down a little bit. There's some key words in this. That's from Dan North, who is the originator of BDD and that's how he describes it. A lot of words in there, most of them, yeah, don't really count too much, but the important parts. <laughs> second generation. This is because behavior-driven development emerged from test-driven development. It didn't pop up out of nowhere. It came from looking at test-driven development and how it works and then thinking, you know what, that's good. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of things that we can improve on. 
So it kind of evolved from that, and it's now the second generation of testing sort of styles that we have. Um, and that's because test-driven development focused too much on the why. Sorry, the, the how, not the why. It's a multiple stakeholder methodology because it gets rid of the idea that there's a developer sat there writing code and that's all that matters with writing software. It sort of brings along this idea that there's more people that are affected by your software in more ways. Um, as a developer, you're developing the software. You're a stakeholder in this piece of software. You may have a tester, dedicated tester on your team that helps come up with the acceptance criteria with a product owner or a business analyst, maybe a designer. If you're working on a piece of software for a point of sale system in a shop, you probably would um, try and get the person who works on that day-to-day -day involved in the software because they're using this day-to-day. -day. They've got a really big stake in what's being built. So they're a stakeholder in this. They've got a very valid and very important opinion in what you're building. So the idea that test-driven development focuses on the developer sat there writing code kind of is thrown out of the window with this side of behavior-driven development. It focuses more on let's talk and let's get people involved. Um, and it's an agile methodology because it works best with short workflows. It doesn't work well with waterfall. It doesn't work well with, right, give me requirements. I'll go and build it, give it back to you in three months. Everything's wrong. I go back to the start. I redo it. I give it to you again in three months, and then we rinse and repeat. It works well with conversations and shorter sort of iterations because it allows you to focus more on talking through things and getting things right um, from an acceptance point of view. And because it requires that collaboration that's sort of a big part of what I consider to be agile, um, it works quite well. So this is a key part of Crucial BDD, is the multiple stakeholders. Um, with the multiple stakeholders, you can help to form a sort of a common language between everyone, which as a developer will then help you sort of drive domain-driven design in terms of ubiquitous language that you're using within your code base. Um, if you're all talking on the same language, it removes the cost of translation when you say ticket and someone else means fair, or you know, you say um, it's a user and someone else calls them a customer. It sort of forms a common language between everyone, so you all know what you're talking about. And that comes through involving multiple people. There will be disagreements. Talk it through. <laughs> it's fine. So with all of this, conversations are really the most important part of behavior-driven development. If there's nothing else to take away from this, it's go and talk about your software. That's the most important part from this. Because it's a collaborative process, because it works with multiple stakeholders, these conversations, they form the requirements that you are putting into your software to actually build. And to quote um, Everzet, who wrote BHAP, uh, sort of the leading scenario BDD tool in PHP, um, if you're not having conversations and your tests aren't the result of those conversations, you're not doing behavior-driven development. And if you don't use those tests to drive the development, then you're not doing test-driven development. So when people say, you know, I'm doing BDD because I use BHAT, are you talking about your things beforehand? Are you collaborating with others? Because if it's just writing your own tests in BHAT, that's test-driven development. That's not behavioral. You're sort of just working on it yourself. So with conversations, there's a few key parts. The most important part is having conversations. Because if you don't have the conversations, then you can't capture them. And we'll come on to capturing them later and how we capture them. And if you don't capture them, you can't automate them. And too many, too often developers go to this part here, not the conversations, they go to automating. They start writing Gherkin files in BHAT and, hey, look, I'm doing BDD because I've got tests. But if you haven't had the conversations from the start, it's not really behavior-driven development because you haven't spoken to anyone about it. You're just writing tests. So you need to have these conversations before you start writing code as a developer. Not too far before, you know, don't have these months and months in advance and then forget what happened. If you're sort of planning your sprints and you've got a set of features you're working on, start talking about the software, you know, a little bit before. Um, and the conversations will continue into building the software. You'll constantly be iterating because the feature you wrote at the start might not be the feature you end up with at the end. But you need to have them before you start writing code. If you've already written code, you've kind of moved into development too soon. Then you can use something to capture the conversations and use them to drive your development. And because you've captured conversations and you're driving development with it, that's where the behavior-driven development side comes from it. Sort of, you come from conversations and in conversations with stakeholders, you end up talking in examples and they draw on their real world experience on how to actually implement what it is you're trying to do. As a developer, you'll have a very clear idea of this is what it should do and this is how it should work. But you're the developer of the software. You're not necessarily the person using the software day to day. 
you're not necessarily the person who has sort of got an ownership in the product. They all have opinions, and it was the, those opinions that sort of take you out of your little development bubble um, and make you realize there's a lot more at stake here. So to quote someone very, very, very sort of knowledgeable and well-regarded in sort of the BDD world, a lady called Liz Keo. she's got an amazing blog that will be linked at the end. But this quote sort of sums up a lot of it for me, and it's that BDD is the art of using examples in conversation to illustrate behavior. Now, what that means is you're using examples in your conversation to drive how the software should work. The examples will form your scenarios that you're putting in your feature files, and those examples come from conversations with real-world um, background. They are essential in what you do, and I know there's a lot of things that are important here, but the two sort of most important things, conversations and examples. Have conversations, talk in examples. Now, the reason examples are essential is because developers, as a general, like to think too much in rules. We get given a set of rules and we think, I can implement those in code, because code is structured and rigid, and rules fit my rigid ecosystem, and that's what I like. So, as an example, you get given a set of requirements, and the requirements are, Students get a 10% discount on all purchases in your store. You say, okay, you go away and implement the code. And your rule is students get 10%. So a student comes along and buys an item at 10 pounds, they get it for nine pounds, job done. But what happens if an item's already been discounted to say five pounds? Does that student get the item at four pound 50? Or does the 50% discount take precedence over the 10% discount they get? With the rules that we speak in, we often don't consider the edge cases. They're not a part of the rule. The rule is just a general, they get 10% off. The rule might come with, oh, but also other promotions have this um, overriding factor. But that won't come from being given a rule. That will only come through talking it through with people, having these examples and having a conversation around, okay, what happens in this example? Talk me through a real world scenario. What actually happened when that student made that purchase of five pounds? What, what, what happened? And what do you want to happen? Those come from examples. So there's a lot of talking involved with BDD. And a question I get asked by developers is, how do I actually work with this? What do I do? Because I can sit and talk about the, the, the features I'm building, and I can have these conversations. But I need something tangible to work with. So who here has used BHAP before? OK. So you'll be familiar with this. In BHAP, we use a language called Gherkin. And it's a domain-specific language. It's got a few keywords that I'll mention in a bit. Um, the links at the bottom and everything, they'll all be on the slides at the end, and the slides will be online, so um, they'll be fine. Um, but Gherkin is a human-readable language, and that's the important part, because if we're having these conversations, we don't want to be writing test cases in something like PHP Unit. A product owner isn't necessarily going to understand that. A sort of front-of-shop, point-of-sale person isn't going to understand what these PHP Unit things are. They need to read code to understand this. Gherkin is a human-readable uh, domain-specific language. And because of that, we can just capture conversations in natural language as we speak, which is really, really handy. There'll be examples of this in a bit. But because of this, because it's um, a domain-specific language that's human-readable, tools can include multilingual support. So if you've got different teams working in different languages, you can include multiple um, different keywords in multiple languages to support them all. Um, including pirates, if you work with them, it supports that as well. Um, Gherkin is a keyword-based system that I'll go through in a minute. But the keywords are really important in how it works and how it's structured. It's line-oriented, so something like YAML, that kind of thing. It's, it's very line-oriented in the way it works. And importantly, Gherkin is documentation for your system. Who here writes documentation for their system as a dedicated task? Who here likes writing documentation for their system? <laughs> Who here realizes as soon as they've written their documentation and someone else changes something, the documentation is now out of date and there's an extra time to go and maintain it? Yeah. But because these feature files that you're writing and these things that you're talking about and you're capturing, they are the direct business requirements. They form the documentation of your system. They're human readable. You can read and see what your system's doing. And because they drive the development of your system and they're used in your test suites, they have to be kept up to date with those new features. So they form a nice documentation point for your system without you realizing that you're writing documentation. And because of this, Gherkin allows automation. And as we know, developers love automation. We will spend weeks and weeks automating a task that we might only run once, just in case. 
So when it comes to writing stories, <laughs> examples of that in the room? I'm guilty of it myself, yeah. I spend six years learning Vim just to, just to make myself five seconds more efficient when I'm doing string replace. Yeah. Um, when we, so when it comes to writing stories in this, we use a feature file, which is a dot feature file, surprisingly enough, in Gherkin. And when you're writing your stories, you need to be descriptive in what you're doing. So when I talk about examples, you need to be descriptive in the sense that don't be too abstract. So if you're, writing, if you're adding products to a basket, give the product a real name, give it a real price. You know, don't just have this abstract, when I add a product to the basket, then the product is in the basket, because that doesn't tell me if the product, is there a product? What's the product cost? Well, if you have three of the products, be descriptive. And that comes through the conversations. Um, features are stories in this world. So when you're, who here has experienced user stories or writes user stories or uses them as a requirement that you're working with? A lot of people, cool. So the user stories sort of define, okay, this is what we expect to happen in the system, and they all occur within a single feature file. You can split them up into further feature files if you want, but as a rule, you have a single feature per file. Don't mix two separate features in the same file. It gets very messy. So who here has seen this format before? As a rule, I want so that... Okay, this is kind of how people see feature files, and this is how they might be structured. User stories sort of fit into this category as well. It's a very basic overview of how the format sort of looks. So it might say, as a shopper, I want to be able to buy products so that I have a gift for my partner. And the so that explains the benefit that we're getting here. This is the business value. This is the why. Why am I doing this? Because as a developer, I find that if I know the why and I know the context behind why I'm doing something, because it gives a lot more meaning to what it is I'm trying to do, I understand what it is I'm trying to do more, and it helps me focus on, okay, what's the higher value in what I'm doing rather than just the code? Which is why, as a rule, don't write your feature files like this. They're not very nice. Um, I prefer taking a book out of Liz, uh, page out of Liz's book and doing it this way, which is put your business value first. That's the important part here. So in order to achieve value, as a role, I want. So in order to buy a gift for my partner for their birthday, for example, as a shopper, I want to be able to add products to a basket. If you put this value first, if this is the most important part, why do people leave it at the end? That's not, that's not a good idea. Put it, at the, put it at the front, and then it becomes the first thing a developer reads. Because they'll read this and go, cool, I'll do that, I'll, and they'll get down to the bottom and they won't, they won't think. The previous example, they'll go, cool, as a role, right, I know who I'm dealing with here, I'm dealing with shoppers. I want feature, at which point the developer will go, I'll implement that now, and they'll jump off to, to implement the feature. They haven't looked at why they want it, they haven't looked at the business value. So if there's nothing else as well when you're writing your feature files, just switch them up a little bit and you'll be surprised how much easier it is to work out what it is you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. So, I've mentioned scenarios before. And a scenario effectively describes a situation to test. Now with BDD, um, BHAT as well as PHP spec, things aren't really referred to as tests. There's no tests in this. It's all scenarios or examples or specifications. But in the conversations we're having when we talk about these examples, the scenarios are your examples in the software you're building. So when you're dealing with these real world examples, that's the scenario, that's what you're using to directly drive the test that you're writing. As I mentioned before, examples are essential in what we're doing. So that's sort of, if you've got these scenarios that actually talk in real world language and deal with real world problems, that's how you get the best software. So with a feature, a feature can have multiple scenarios. And th all that means is a single feature, a single user story, can have multiple examples and multiple scenarios to go through that user story. You might test the same scenario with different parameters. Or you might test, say for example, user authentication. You might split that out so that login and log out are two completely separate parts of it. And then on the login side, you might think, actually, password reset, I'll consider that part of login. It's up to you how you split it out, but that's a different scenario, that's a different example to successfully logging into the system. But they form part of the same overall feature. So within a scenario, because everything's line-based, we have steps, not the band from the 90s, but steps in BHAP. And a step details each part of an example. It de uh, describes each action that should be taken by the system or the user 
in order to drive the example that you're working with. And like features can have multiple scenarios, scenarios can have multiple steps, but that's because multiple things happen or need to happen for a scenario to, to, uh, to take place. So I've mentioned a few keywords before with BHAP. Um, I'm saying Gherkin more specifically. We'll go through those now. There's a who in testing or test driven development has heard of arrange act assert or assemble act assert? It's kind of this idea that when you're testing, you need to arrange your testing space. Then you act on the system that you're testing, and then you assert that something has happened. And the arrange is an important part because if you're not in the same state at the start to begin with, when you act on the system, you can't be sort of guaranteed that the outcome at the end will be the same as what you expected it to be. So if you've got a system that adds two to a number, your uh, assert might be the number equals four, your arrange step will be two. It starts with two, it adds two, you get four. But if you didn't have that arrange step in, what number are you starting with? Because if we started with five, well now you've got seven, the test won't work. So the arrange step is kind of the important part in this, and that's what the given step sort of equates to within BHAT. It puts the system in a known state. If you're not in a known state at the start, you can't rely on your tests to act the same each time you run them. So then we come to actually acting, and that's the key action that happens with a when step. Now, this is sort of the thing that you're testing. This is the key thing that absolutely has to work correctly. Um, it could be a sim the, the act of actually adding a product to the basket. It could be the act of registering a user on the site. That's the important part that we're testing here. So that's the act. And then the observable outcome side, the assertion, that's in your then step. This is kind of then, I should see this happen, this will happen, this will have taken place. And this effectively asserts that behavior within our system is correct as to what we think it should be. So a general step, um, a general scenario in BHAT will look a little bit something like this. A very basic example. But the given, given I have a large t-shirt product, that sort of assembles my stage, that sets my workspace up. I've got a large t-shirt product to work with. When I add the large t-shirt to my basket, that's our key thing. This is the action that we need, that we need to verify works. The then step says, then I should have a large t-shirt product in my basket. Um, that's If the product isn't in the basket after the when step, there's something wrong, something's broken, it's not working correctly. But along with this, because Gherkin's a human readable format, we have AND. And what AND does is effectively chain multiple steps together. It doesn't really have a lot of meaning. It can be used in a given step, or a when step, or a then step. And what it allows is just a bit more context and a bit more meaning behind what we do. And there's also a step called but. And effectively works in the same way as and. But because it's a bit more human readable, it allows us to give a bit more context behind things and a little bit more natural language. So an example like this allows us to sort of say, right, given I have a large t-shirt product that costs £9.99, and I have an empty basket, and I'm a tax exempt customer, that sets up my working space. When I add a large t-shirt to my basket, then I have a large t-shirt in my basket, and the basket total should be £9.99, but I do not have tax applied to my order. So the way it reads is very much like you might talk in natural language. It's very human readable. You could give this to anyone, and they will be able to understand what's happening, why it's happening, because not only have we written it in a human readable format, but we're using real world values. We're using, oh, there's a large t-shirt product. That's easy to work out. And there's a price. And I can see that that price sort of carries on and this is how it works through the system. Rather than being abstract, we're using an actual example of what could actually happen. And that's where sort of the power in this comes. You've got these human readable things that pick up on and then this can just happen however you <laughs> like it. And we'll, I'll show you how that sort of executes into BHAT code um, in a little bit. So our story structure in our user story, in our feature file, um, generally looks a little bit like this. You'll see at the top, this is written before I change the way I write feature files, so forgive me. As a customer, I want to be able to add products to my basket so that I can have a gift for my partner. The scenario describes what happens, but this is the whole thing is our feature. There could be multiple scenarios. For the sake of space, I generally don't put it on, but that, the whole thing is your feature. When we come to the scenario, that's just this block here. This effectively up the top doesn't really execute in code, it just gives us context behind what we're working with. And then further to that, we've got a step. And the step is, this is the individual action that is taken via our keywords in Gherkin. So, this is cool, but how do developers work, work, work with it? 
in BHAP, we have something called step definitions. And what a step definition does is it matches one of those lines that we have in our feature file with executable code that can actually run. So in this example, it says, given I have a large t-shirt product, so that's the steps we were dealing with before, and that matches through a doc block in an annotation in PHP, matches this step here. It's got this little at given at the start, and when BHAT runs, it will pick up on that and know that it can match anything that matches this to the function below. And you'll notice there's kind of this placeholder here of product. And that's what in BHAT's referred to as an argument. It's not an argument between conversational people and shouting at each other. It's the ability to say, this is a placeholder. This is a value that can be substituted with a number of different things and then passed into the function. So in our example here, between the quotes where we've got large t-shirt product, that would be passed through to our code to execute as a string. So we've now got that value from our example to work with in code and do something with. So further to this, we've got something called transformers. Now, there'll be a little example that'll explain why this is beneficial in a second. But effectively, what they allow you to do is transform the way arguments are passed into your code to execute. So you might have a number of common operations that happen in BHAT, and you don't want to do things with that value every single time you work with it. It just becomes hassle, it becomes annoying, and developers are lazy. So we, have, we can have traits and sort of extend them with functionality. So what you do is you have this, have this doc block with at transform. And in BHAT, what this does is it says, right, I'm going to look for any placeholder where it's listed as count. And if anyone's curious, this whole sort of syntax of colon variable name is called the turnip syntax. I don't know the obsession with food, but I learned that recently. It's called turnip, and I really liked it. You can do this with regex, because you can write your step definitions with regex. It's horrible. It's ugly. It's really hard to get, uh, it's really hard to get right and very easy to get wrong. I've seen recently in a library a regex pattern that basically matches given the following and then anything else. So anything you want to do is caught by the step definition, and you cannot overwrite it. Don't ever do that. Made my life hell. So what this does is this basically says any time you use this placeholder, this turnip placeholder in your step definitions, run this function. So you might have a count variable in your, um, your step definitions and in your scenarios. But the way that would be passed through to bhat is it would pass it through as a string. It doesn't understand sort of the concept of types. It just passes everything through as a string. And if you're passing the count to something like PHP unit to assert something, it will break because PHP unit will say, you're giving me a string. I need an integer. It doesn't do the casting for you. So something like this is really helpful because you can then pass a count through. Every time it runs, it will return the int val of whatever's there and give it to your function. And then your function can run, assuming it is an integer. I don't need to worry about it. That's a simple example, but a really helpful example. It's a little bit more code. Don't worry. I'll talk you through it. This effectively, if I've got a product, and I've got a product named large t-shirt product, if I wanted to work with that in my scenarios, and I'm actually doing some end-to-end -end tests or some higher level tests that maybe talk to a database, every time I use that, I would have to go to the database, fetch the product with that name, return it, and then I've got the entity to work with. That gets really old really fast. So something like this allows you to effectively cast that product to an entity. So whenever you're working with it, you can say, transform a product um, and then pick it up by its name and this just get the entity manager, get the right uh, class, find one by the name. If it doesn't find it, it will throw an exception which will cause BHAP to fail, but we would expect that because if you're referencing a product that doesn't exist in one of your steps, there's something wrong. Um, and then if not, it will return the new product. So that then means in our steps when we're referencing this product, I don't need to go and fetch it from the database every single time I'm working with it. I've just got a product entity to work with and I can assume it's there. That's really helpful. We've also got the concept of tags in BHAP, and these effectively just allow you to sort of categorize the way tests run. You can group them together, um, you can pull out different things, and you can run different scenarios, different steps, that kind of thing. In BHAT, they've got a slightly weird syntax. They look a bit like this. So what this means is, at domain says pick up a test or a scenario that has a domain tag, which it matches here. And this tilde, means not, why can't we use an exclamation mark, but I don't know. But that means not, so WIP for me and my test means work in progress. I might have written a scenario, but I don't actually want to execute it yet because it's still in progress. And same with in prog, it's just kind of like another alias for me. So what this says is run any, um, run any scenario or feature that's tagged with domain, but is not work in progress and is not in progress. 
Uh, so something like this, this test would run and it would execute and it would happen under my domain suite. With the ability for this as well, we've got hooks. And what hooks allow you to do in bhat is execute arbitrary bits of code before and after certain things happen. So we can run them before a suite, before a scenario, before a feature, even before a step or after a step. So before and after every single step, you can have a piece of code execute. I haven't yet found a use case for it, but you can do. So examples of the way I've used hooks before. Um, before a scenario runs, I've used it to reset my database back to a known, like, an empty state. That's quite a handy thing to do. Um, I recently wrote a hook. We had some tests failing in CI, and the CI suite for this product um, spun up Docker containers and then just killed them off at the end of the CI suite running. And I had some tests failing, and I found it really difficult to work out what was causing that test failure, because the containers only live as long as the test suite runs. So I wrote a quick bhat context that's actually available as an extension. And what it does is you add it into your bhat config. When a test fails, it uses MySQL dump to just dump the database out into a file for you. So we dump it out into a file and then have uh, Team City, which is our CI uh, tool, just archive it off for us at the end of the build. And then when the end of the build comes, I've got uh, an SQL file with the contents of the database at that point in time when the test failed. So with hooks, I was able to say, I need to be able to do something at this point in time. And I was able to hook into the test process uh, and execute whatever code I wanted to be able to do that. So yeah, they run before and after suites, features, scenarios, and steps. So something like this would allow you to reset the entity manager if you're using something like Doctrine. But if you're not, you could have it pull in an SQL file that you've got that maybe is the structure of your database or use whatever uh, persistence layer engine you're using to reset it back to a known state. And all this does is it says before the scenario, store the tags. If it has a reset EM tag, then get the entity manager for me, prepare a purger for it, purge it, and then reset it. And under the surface, that uses Doctrine to basically clear out the entity manager, clear out all the database, and then effectively create a new schema based on the entities I've got. We've actually recently changed this because we realized our test suite then doesn't cater for migrations because it will just pick up the entities rather than the migrations. So we now have it before the entire suite runs. It runs the migrations, creates a file for us that we then use as the rest of our data um, in our subsequent tests. So with suites and profiles, you can run sort of the same criteria or different criteria for your step definitions under the hood. They don't, your step definitions don't have to change, but you can test them with different configurations. So you could load one configuration for one test, different one for a different one. I'll actually demonstrate this in a, in a little bit with the BHAT demo that I've got. So an example of this is you can use the same feature files or you can use different ones. So you might have some features that only refer to sort of the web interface of your product. They are very UI specific, which is fine, not always the way to go, but it's fine to have that. But I would generally put those in a separate suite to the main tests for my, uh, my application because then I can manage them differently. I can handle them in a slightly different way and I can say, you know what, these tests are slightly separate to everything else in the system. But combine them with tags and you can use the same feature file to test different implementations. So the way this works under the hood is you could have something like this. And this, this would run on my web UI suite. So in a web UI suite, I'm actually testing the UI of the website through a web browser. And on my given step, I might have a step definition that says, given this a product name which costs price, and all this is doing is it's basically creating a new product entity, putting it in the database for me. So this is my setup step. This is assuming I've got a product to work with, so put one in the database ready for me to work with it. But if I'm testing a, my domain level, you know, my objects without worrying about persistence and that kind of thing, I don't necessarily need to do all of this. So in a domain suite, what I can do is I can say, given there is a product which costs price, same step definition as before, under the surface, bhat would load a different file, and it would load this function. And all this would do is it would put the product into like an in-memory store, which is a lot quicker because I'm just testing the way objects interact. So that allows me to run domain level tests without caring about a database, but I can use the same step definition, which defines the business rule to implement it in both a browser and at code level. So in this example, you can have a UI suite that has completely different step definitions than a service or domain or a lower level suite to work with. So, Something like this on our domain level would be, you know what, I'm adding a product to the basket. So just call the add product method on the basket. That's the action we're testing here. But on the web side of things, actually you need to visit the product URL and you need to press the button that says add to basket because that's the way the web works. 
So what this allows you to do with these suites and tags, you can change the implementation without changing the documented business rules. And for me, this is where the power lies. This is like the really powerful part of something like this system when used properly. Because who's ever encountered this? Implementation changing way more frequently than business rules. Implementation changes all the time when a new fad comes out and the UI has to change to match it. The business rules are pretty much the same. So we'll deal with writing a good story. What's a good story to work with? We'll, we'll just use the example I've got before. Who can spot the issues in this, in this scenario? Who's Dan? Text is hard coded. Had to ask it. Yeah? Yep. Uh, URL. So in this scenario, I've got a URL here, given I'm on this page, and when I press add to basket. So this is, this is I'm not documenting a business rule here, I'm doc documenting an implementation. This is how I've implemented the business rule. I've seen a lot of, who's written feature files like this before? Yeah, we're all guilty of it if you've used Behat. Um, a better way to write this is like this. It's performing the same actions, but it's describing it in a business rule language that we've had through conversations. I can still do the same things under the surface as I've mentioned with the suites and the profiles, but here, I'm not counting on buttons, I'm not pressing things, I'm not visiting pages, I'm not seeing things on a page, I'm just documenting what happens in business world. So back to our previous example, as Dan mentioned, what happens when this says add to cart? The UX team comes along and says, yeah, we've done some focus groups and they've decided they don't like the word button. We're going to change it to say add to cart across the shop. At which point you sit there and go, oh no, I'm going to have to find and replace in every single file. There's probably going to be one that's missed and this would need to change. The whole thing behind this is that, that rule, that business rule, which is add to basket, shouldn't need to change because some text on a website changes. That's a business rule, not an implementation. So key, don't write implementation in features. I've seen it, I've done it, I don't do it anymore. But if you need a way to avoid this, if you're, not, if, you're, if you're not having the conversations and you just need a way to start thinking outside of the implementation you're working with, think about how it would work in the real world. Think about if you were writing a mobile app or a command line interface. Could you click a button or go to a URL on the command line? No. Do you go into a store and visit a page to buy something? No, you don't. You add it to your basket. This is kind of where the power lies. We recently had a product where we built a web interface to something and we had our business rules documented in, in BHAP and they, there was no implementation in them. So what we were able to do is when we came to build the mobile app that had the same functionality as the web, we could then reuse those documented business rules in the mobile app testing suite. It was really handy because we didn't have to redo everything. We knew what's the functionality we were working towards. We're doing the same thing, just in a different environment. That shouldn't have to change. So. Demo time. Oh, no, not in summary. Demo time. Okay, so for the sake of speed, just so we don't run over on time, I'm actually going to... Oh, no. We'll do that. Right, what I've got here is I've got a feature file that is actually implemented. So in PHP Storm, if you, anyone uses that, um, there's some really handy things, such as when you've got feature files and you've got step definitions in them. If you do whatever your context click is in on PHP Storm, you can actually go and retrieve the things that it acts on. Um, hang on a second, let me change my resolution. Right. So what this allows us to do is sort of view the steps that, we're, that are happening within our feature file. So our feature file is documented. I've got a domain and a web UI suite that are acting on this scenario. I'm buying a single product and it's set up where it's a PlayStation 4 and it costs 250 pounds. When I add it to the basket, I should have one product in the basket, and the basket price should be £250. Up at the top, I've documented a few things here, you know, so that I can buy gifts for friends as a customer, I need to be able to put them in a basket. I've got a couple of rules here. These don't actually affect the way BHAT runs, this is just like a little scratch pad for me to kind of keep an eye on the things that I'm working with. And there's some comments, I'll link this as well, all this is on GitHub, you can go and pull it down and play around with it and try it. Um, but it's got some further scenarios that you could write, things you could do, um, and then some sort of notes on other bits and pieces. But the important part for us is how does this actually work? So under the surface, I've got two different suites. I've got a web UI context and a domain context. They load in here. 
So what we've got in BHAT, this is configuration. There's documentation for this. I'm going to skip through it fairly quickly, but this, I'm just sort of brief exp explanation of how it works. You configure a suite. And that suite, in one case, I've got a domain suite here. I've got a work in progress suite. I've got a web UI suite. And I've got a JavaScript suite. I can do different things. So my domain level loads a basket domain context. And that deals with code under the surface. That deals with the objects talking to each other, doesn't care about browsers, doesn't care about persistence. That just does code under the surface. So our step definitions, where we've got a product, given there's a product which costs this much, much like the slide, I just add it to a temporary in-memory store. I don't care about persisting in a database, just reference it via an array. And then when I add it to the basket, call the basket add product method. That's the important part that I'm testing here. Then I can make assertions on the overall basket price. So the overall basket price should be this much, and I should have this many products in the basket. So I call the get total basket the total price method, and I assert that it equals the, the price that I'm passing, and I assert the count that I'm passing matches the basket price. In tests, what this is going to do, this is going to be really slow because it's running in Docker on Mac, which is horrendous. Um, but what it's going to do is this behind the scenes is just running a Docker command to execute my domain suite. And it's going to run through, and it's going to show you each of the steps executing. In reality, this actually takes like fractions of a, fr fractions of a second. Um, but what it's done here is it's just run through, run through all my steps, and it's executed the code that um, I'm actually implementing. So B has on the command line, fairly simple thing to work with. But what now I can do is run a... web UI context. Now under the surface, when I run my web suite, it's going to pick up on this filter here. And what this is going to do is it's going to say, right, instead, a context in BHAT is basically the code that executes under the surface. It's the context in which you're testing this thing. So this loads a set of different contexts to the domain above it. So the domain loads one context to talk to objects. This one loads a basket web UI context that allows it to interact with a browser. It runs a schema context, which resets the database. Um, it also uses an Alice context, which um, Alice is, who's used or heard of Alice before? Yeah, really handy, um, written by Geordi and Nelmio, the guy who uh, focuses on Composer. It's a fixture loader. So what you can do is you can define entities and bits of data in YAML files, and that gives you those entities constructed as objects. Um, and with K and P and B hat, it will load those into your database for you. So those given steps I've had where I'm setting up products and putting them in the database, I could actually do those in fixtures. Because in reality, I'm probably going to need more than just a product to work with. I might need some default users. I might need some categories and other bits and pieces. So that allows you to do that. But under the surface, this loads a different UI context, which, as per the slides that you've sort of already seen, effectively uses the same step definition here but now, because we're using Alice, this step doesn't need to do anything. I've left it in for readability, because it makes sense to sort of describe where I'm at. And then further down the line, where previously I was calling the add to basket method on the basket object to add a product in, well, now I'm dealing with a web UI, and I'm dealing with a browser. So I need to actually open a page, and I need to add it to the basket. And there's some page objects under the surface, but effectively, they just allow me to do things with a URL, effectively. Same step definitions for then I should have number and then I should have the price correct. But these are looking at different things. These are looking at the web page to make sure they're correct. They're not dealing with objects under the surface. In reality, this effectively works very much like the domain suite. You'll notice one thing, though. If you look at the time for the domain suite, 4.69 seconds, this is a web UI suite. So this is now running, and it's driving under the surface. It's driving a browser. There's a real browser executing this. Real. It's a headless one, but it's a lot slower. So that ran two scenarios and took 15.36 seconds. So same thing. I've tested my UI a lot slower, but I can do that. And just to prove to you that it's working, uh, password is secret. Under the surface, I've got another test suite. And it uses Selenium. Who's used Selenium before? Who's heard of Selenium before? Anyone not heard of Selenium? Selenium is a way to interact with a real browser. 
I can fire up an actual instance of Chrome or Firefox or a number of other browsers and actually do things in a real browser. So things like JavaScript will execute as per the browser would do it. It's a lot slower. But we can see it working, just to prove I'm not fobbing you all off. So if I run my JavaScript suite, what this is doing is under the surface, it's running my web UI suite, but with a JavaScript tag. And it's only going to run one scenario, I believe. So it's going to execute. And what you'll see in this window is an actual browser window pop up. Really quickly, it will add the product to the basket, go to the product page, do all that sort of stuff. But it's just to prove that it's actually working. So Chrome is opened. It's gone to the product page. It's clicked Add to Basket. It's seen on the page that the basket is correct, and it's closed down Chrome. So under the surface, I've now documented a business rule and a business, implement, uh, business value that's about adding products to the basket. Without changing my feature file, without changing my documented rules, I've tested the domain of the code under the surface. I've tested it through a browser and through a UI and a browser with JavaScript, and I haven't had to change a single line of my documented features. That's really helpful. So in summary, conversations, 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 conversations. It sounds really silly sometimes, because people are sort of like, yeah, but I can't talk all the time. But the time you spend talking will be time you save later on in development. You need your stories told by real-world examples. You need to use those user stories as the requirements for the software you're building. You need, to involve, you need to involve multiple stakeholders in the conversations you're having. That way you get the best value out of the conversations. You get the best examples that, the, that, you, that you need to work with. You need to write those features before you write code. And as I've just proven with those features there, you need to write features without implementation. That comes by writing features before code. It comes by writing features without thinking about code. When you're having these conversations as a developer, we tend to start jumping towards implementation very quickly. <coughs> Try to avoid that as best you can. Because the implementation you think of probably won't solve the problem that you actually need to solve. At the beginning, you'll have a conversation, and you'll capture that conversation. In the middle, you'll automate and you'll implement that conversation, which is the part developers love. And at the end, you'll end up with happy stakeholders, well-built software. It does the right thing. It does it properly. There's a load of links and reading for homework. I really honestly can recommend every single one of these links. Um, Dan North, the guy who came up with BDD as a concept, very knowledgeable on this. Liz Keo, fantastic, fantastic resource. Uh, her website is. And Vika's got a lot of stuff. You've probably seen them around. They're very, very prominent in the PHP community. Cucumber Docs has got a lot of stuff there. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. You can find me there on my email if you want to talk about this stuff. I'll happily talk about it with you. It's a joined in link if you want to give feedback. No pressure, just whatever you want to do. And that's about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Yes. Uh, could you have... Um a scenario that you, you would execute in a domain, but not in your web UI? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just use those as an example. I put them in both. But effectively, yes. Um, have you seen or heard of the testing pyramid before? Uh, testing pyramid, for anyone who doesn't know, is a shape pyramid. At the bottom, you have a wide, wide range of unit tests, because they are fast, and they don't take a lot of time to run. Um, so you would have a lot of more domain type tests in that level of test suite, um, and a little bit above that. But yes, I would generally have far more domain tests than I would web UI tests, mainly because um, web UI is, not only is it slow, it's a lot more prone, because it's more implementation heavy, it's a lot more prone to break when implementation does change. So the feature files won't have to change, but the context under the surface that actually drive things may have to. So they're a lot more likely to change, they're a lot more to maintain. So I would generally have less web UI tests and I would test the critical path through the application. So for something like adding a product to a basket, don't necessarily in the web UI, don't test every single possible variation and what happens if I put an emoji in the quantity box. And You don't need to do that stuff through the web UI. Just test the critical path, which is you can successfully add it and that will be fine. But absolutely, you can have tests that are in one suite and aren't in the other one. That's pretty much how they should be used a lot of the time. Yeah. Yes? What's your take on resetting the database between scenarios? Do it. Do it. So you're in the do it camp. Oh, absolutely, because if I've got a scenario that leaves a product in the database and I've got another scenario that relies on a certain number of products existing in the database, what happens when they run out of order? 
the second. I'm very much of the, ca the case of every single test should run independently of every other test. It should, f it should function whether there was a thousand tests executed before it or no tests executed before it. So that's why web UI tests and higher level tests that interact with the database can be very slow because between each scenario, you're clearing out a database and resetting it and that can take a couple of seconds. But I'm very much of the opinion that you need to reset it after every single test because otherwise you end up with like global state between tests and that can get very, very, very fiddly. A good way to verify if you've got that, BHAT has the option to run tests in a random order. So you'll soon find. The reason why I'm asking is like I've, I've come across both sort of, I, I still haven't decided which camp right. I'm on because the other, other people say that you should be able to take any database and as long as you insert your products and you reference them by some kind of unique ID, you don't really care what's in the database. And then it, it kind of is also an issue of speed as well because sometimes when you run the tests on CI, rather than resetting the database after every test <coughs> that takes X, yeah. you just do it like before or after a suite or something. And do. then if it technically, some people claim that if you write your tests well, then you're not gonna run into clashes or you won't really care about anything else that's in the, in the database, right. so. I'd respectfully disagree with those people, to be fair. Um, if you, like, for, for we found that very problem in the sense that we had test suites that were running far too slowly. We also noticed some other problems. So what we decided to do, instead of using Doctrine's Entity Manager to reset the database and do all the heavy lifting under the surface, we've got a context um, that looks at the runs before a scenario, uh, before a suite, sorry. So before the entire suite runs, it effectively migrates the database and then snapshots that into an SQL file. So it's not got any data in it, but the database structure is there. And then when we come to reset the database, we effectively delete everything with a MySQL command and dump the SQL back in, which is a lot quicker than using Doctrine to do the, the lifting in code. So we still reset it. It's now a lot quicker. Um, but there is a big concern between, yeah, you've got to do a lot of heavy lifting between scenarios to reset a database, and they get very, very slow. Like a counter argument to that is actually we had a case where we got an odd bag just because we happened to have leftover data from the previous test as well. So sometimes you might catch odd scenarios because like in the real world, you don't have a clean database. You'll have a database with like all the data. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and sometimes some of our tests, I can't remember exactly what it was, but we did have a case where just because we ended up having two products in the database instead of one, for example, something went wrong because there were two, not one, and the code was only able to deal with one. So actually like by accident. It caught a test by accident. By accident, yeah. That's a rare It's kind of more, more like real world like though, because yeah. It like, can be, yeah. Like some people like, I'm kind of in depends on the on the day and on the case, but like some people are like you should use a real world database which can have a lot of messy data, a lot of whatever, and then some people are like clean pristine database. Well, when I say clean database, I don't mean that there's nothing in it. I mean in the sense that it's in a known state. With something like Alice or a fixture loader, I can load a load of messy random data into it, and that will be my known state. But the next time I come to run that test, it's going to have the exact same messy data in, rather than messy data plus whatever the other tests added in themselves. So I would always reconstruct that data in a fixture and add that in myself rather than... When I, yeah, when I say clean database, I don't mean there's nothing in it and it's just the schema. I mean it's more, it's ready to go for this test with whatever that might need. If it needs a thousand products, add a thousand products in. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, you have to do any of the PHP unit tests, or traditionally the unit tests. So yes. Do you have to do that? Oh, no, I, if you're going to learn one, unit, one testing tool, learn PHP unit, don't learn BHAP. <laughs> um, PHP is a very versatile testing tool. It can do everything. Um, we use a combination of BHAP, PHP spec, and PHP unit. Um, and they all serve different purposes for different reasons. Um, I wouldn't write lots of unit tests in BHAP because it gets very messy. It's more for a higher, like more acceptance and functional type testing, a bit more than that, or integration level rather than unit. So I still write all my unit tests in PHP unit or PHP spec. Um, and then BHAP is for slightly higher level, but absolutely. Um, use them both. They all serve different purposes. They all have different use cases. But if you're going to learn one, learn PHP unit, forget the rest. Yes? Um, one place to the first question. Um, how would you organize your testing process? Because think a uh, more sort of um, a longer example, like for example, if you're explaining the chat process, yes. you might have four or five steps. Yep. Now, if you're writing test for one of the later steps, you might want to give them first steps happen, and then the second step, and the first steps happen, but how would you, would you put it? Would you somehow refactor those steps into another? So when you say steps, do you mean the pre like the previous scenarios? Of uh, previous occasions. Right, okay. Um, you could do, and you, effectively those could be part of those that given step. Um, I, 
I would try to refactor that out where possible, because if you're interacting with the UI as an example, that would be a very slow process to do, given I'm on this page and I fill out this form and I submit it, and then I go to the next page and I fill out the form and I submit it. That could be a very lengthy thing. So I would potentially try and reconstruct that in code and then only have the action or the when <laughs> do it through the UI. That's not always possible and you will have to sometimes do that with a test. But when you're doing that as an example, only test the critical path through the checkout. Don't try and test every little edge case with that because those tests will take a long time to run. And they'll, tests take a long time to run, developers don't run them. They just push them to CI and let CI fail and then it becomes useless. Um, if you're executing it, for example, would you, um, you have these, um, potentially it's I'll discuss that with the afters okay because that, that's a really specific example but I can probably go through that it, I would always try and consider them in isolation so what you're saying is the first scenario goes given the first page completes correctly. Second one is second, first and second page complete correctly. What I would probably say is don't test the first and second and the third one. Just do the fourth one, but do them all. And then sort of by implication, the first, second and third should have succeeded to get to the fourth. Sounds a bit weird. You could do. It's a weird way of doing it. And I'd have to, it's more, I'd have to talk through that a bit more to work it out because that's a, sort of specific example but yeah I'd try and avoid doing the first one and then the first one and the second one and then the first second and third and then because when you get by the time you get to the fourth one you've implicitly tested the first three anyway so yeah so there's a question over there somewhere yes uh, yeah. your basket circles uh, would you still add PHP unit tests uh, I would add a lower level of tests as well yes T to test all the edge cases to test what happens if I try and add a product that doesn't exist or whatever domain level tests I would need to verify that I would add those as well yes the bhat uh, test would be sort of more of a higher level making sure the objects sort of talk to each other correctly um, that example is a really basic one it's not too real world sort of specific it's more just to get the points across than an actual this is how it is done it's done that a lot a lot like that it's just a really simple example to get it across but I would write unit tests for the lower level stuff, the objects, the services I might, yeah, I'll perform sort of integration tests on those or functional tests on those. Um, they might be in BHAT, they might be in PHP unit, it depends what level I'm, I'm executing at. But I would generally have a BHAT test that was a higher level one that went through everything. Yes. Any more questions? No? Cool, let's take a break. Cheers.